Let me start by saying this is in no way a message against any other faith. Uh, I fully believe in the interfaith uh, connection and respect all religions. Amen. Social media has become a place for public theology and theological education. Your social media may not be as full as mine of theological discourse because probably about 75% of my Facebook friends are clergy or somehow connected to theological education. But I'm sure that if you look closely and listen closely to other media, you'll see and hear debates about what we should and should not be doing and who we should and should not be voting for as Christians. Most folks use the Bible in their argument. Now, possibly more than ever, because of social media and media in general, the divisiveness of Christianity is on full display. And it is disturbing. So-called Christian perspectives on everything from abortion, affirmative action, immigration, marriage equality, violence, and war are all over the map. The divide between perspectives, so-called Christian perspectives, is as far as the East is from the West. And when you stop and think about it, as a Christian, it is beyond troubling, it's frustrating, it's sad, and the depth of how off some people are about it all, in my humble opinion, is tragic. But I guess in any faith tradition where most people are dependent on the interpretation of an ancient text, in any faith tradition where people consider themselves part of that faith tradition but aren't really doing anything with it or through it, in any faith tradition where, pe where people full of hate and fear and maybe even greed and they're oblivious to the condition of their hearts, can rise up and become faith leaders, draw followers, and teach them in error just because they can? I guess in any faith tradition, this can happen. The Apostle Paul saw the division starting to happen in his ministry and addressed it as part of his letter to the follow followers of Ephesus. He saw the division and he encouraged the followers of Ephesus to have unity. No, actually he begged them to work to have unity. Let's go to the text, Ephesians 4.1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Paul begged the people to make every effort to remain unified as followers of Christ. He told them it would require humility, gentleness, patience, and love, all often missing in discourse today, and begged them to work on being unified, bonded with peace. If only those of the faith today could heed those words, why did Paul need to even go there? Well, Paul saw and one could say was responsible for the growing diversity of the followers of Christ. Kind of a DEI officer of the time. After all, he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, meaning that he spread the gospel beyond the Jews to the Gentiles. We are Gentiles, by the way. And it was, and for, it was the revelation to him that Jesus Christ was Lord of all. In Ephesians 2.11, Paul says, So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the, the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, 
right? There's two groups here. Remember that you were at that time without Christ. Being aliens, he says, from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise. Strangers to the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, Paul says, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul, a Jew himself who once persecuted followers of Christ, then becomes not only a follower but answers his call to include the Gentiles, knows firsthand that the division is possible for at one time he was the divider, the persecutor. He knows firsthand the opinions of the time that Jews had about Gentiles and vice versa. He knew firsthand that human difference can be a stumbling block, even for people of faith. And he knew that if operating in their humanness, the division could be dangerous, because he was once the danger. So Paul begged the people to work on having unity. He knew how divided things could be as followers of Christ. I feel, Paul, at times it feels like the Christian faith is so very disjointed and about to self-destruct, like the gates of hell might prevail. Sometimes it feels like we're not far off from that dark abyss of annihilation that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King wrote about in his book, Strength to Love. So Paul begged and, con and God continued to inspire him with words to aid his plea. For in his desperation to encourage unity, Paul makes some heartfelt, sincere, and simply brilliant statements that became central to the faith. After encouraging every effort of unity through humility, gentleness, and peace, Paul makes his point of unity solid by saying, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Paul devises words almost like a marketing campaign for unity. Can't you see it on a t-shirt? It looks good on the front of the bulletin. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord. We may have differences, but we claim faith in one Lord. Our belief in one Lord leads to one faith. No person's faith or no ethnicity's faith is greater. There is one faith. And our outward expression of faith is the same for us all. It's called baptism, and there's only one, multiple ways, but one baptism, one Lord. You can't get more unified than one. There's one Lord. Whether you're Baptist or UCC or Catholic, there's one Lord. Whether you're Southern Baptist or American Baptist, there's one Lord. Whether you're black, white, red, brown, or green, there is one Lord. Whether you're in the snow-capped mountains of Colorado or the sweltering heat of Mississippi, there is one Lord. Why is that significant in the plea for unity? I'm glad you asked, because if we pay attention to the one Lord, if we study closely the words and the actions of the one Lord, we can, I believe, and I can be optimistic sometimes, kind of dreamy, you know, vision, prayerfully, maybe we can move towards with God's miraculous hand, a unified body. And so Paul gives us the next powerful words in his campaign. And that is to call the unified body of followers the body of Christ. Isn't that brilliant? Paul, inspired, no doubt, by the Holy Spirit, was indeed brilliant. This is for those even outside of the church, outside of Hyde Park Union Church even, who were never taught in their faith to pay attention to Jesus. 
I'm talking about Christians, who've never been taught to pay attention to Jesus' ministry because if there is ever, in my holy imagination, going to be unity, I know it's far-fetched, the chasm is wide, but, but if our ministry at High Park Union Church reaches one person, changes the heart and mind of one, that's a start. After all, another important metaphor in our faith is the mustard seed. Ask your neighbor if you didn't catch that one. If those who are followers of Christ, whoever and wherever they may be, move towards being the body of Christ, who is the one Lord of our faith, we move towards greater unity. How does the metaphor body of Christ help us? Glad you asked a second question. Well, if we simply pay attention and do what the body of Christ did, we are being faithful to our call as literal followers of Christ and we can move towards a unified body, no matter who we are or where we are. So let's look at the body of Christ. First, there is the mind of Christ. Say the mind of Christ. It was Paul also who said, let this mind be in you, Philippians 2 and 6 which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Jesus, being very God, humbled himself to become a man, a human, to serve humanity, and in order to be the body of Christ, we need the mind of Christ, the mind of humility and service. We need humility when we're wrong and humility when we're right. We need humility when we're in charge and humility when we are not in charge. We need humility to serve the poor, the disenfranchised, the hurting, and the suffering. We need humili humility to get dirty and to serve the least of these. Our brothers and sisters, Jesus said, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And when I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. And when I was in prison, you visited me. When did you do this? In his parable was asked, and he said, when you did it unto others, you did it unto me. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, a mind of humility and service. To be the body of Christ, we not only need the mind of Christ, we need the eyes of Christ. Say the eyes of Christ. It was the estranged and battered servant girl, Hagar, in the book of Genesis, who first called God el Roi, the one who sees me. Jesus continued as El Roi, for Jesus saw the woman at the well. Jesus saw the man at the pool. Jesus saw blind Bartimaeus. Jesus saw the hungry multitude. And when Jesus sees, he has compassion. And he ministers, and he speaks, and he listens. And he heals, and he sets free. How do you know when you're looking at people with the eyes of Christ? Well, if you look and judge, if you look and are frustrated, and if you look and turn away, or like the disciples want them to turn away, then you're looking with your eyes. But as the body of Christ, with the eyes of Christ, we will see people who are otherwise invisible to the world. See them as made in the image of God. See people and have compassion. See people and see their need. Then we are being the body of Christ with the eyes of Christ. But not only the mind and the eyes of Christ, but we need the mouth of Christ. Somebody say the mouth of Christ. When Jesus opened his mouth, he spoke to those he wasn't supposed to speak to. He spoke to the woman and the Samaritans and the Samaritan women. And they always ran and told it and people were saved. 
He spoke to demons and said, get out, and they got out. He spoke to the winds and the waves and said, peace, be still, and nature obey. He spoke words of comfort, my peace I give to you. Words of liberation, get up. Take up your bed and walk. Words of conviction, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Words of love and affirmation, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Prophetic words of justice to bring good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free. Jesus spoke truth to power, called out hypocrites, and challenged the status quo. Jesus spoke to everyone and everything, and when he spoke, things changed. Situations changed. Nature changed. When Jesus spoke, people changed, and the church as the body of Christ has been too silent on some matters, and, and we're called to speak like Jesus. Speak life into dead situations. Speak health into lives of the sick, speak prophetic words of justice, speak truth to power, to be the body of Christ. We not only need the mind and the eyes and the mouth of Christ, we also need the legs and the feet and the hands of Christ. Jesus' legs and feet took him out of the synagogue and into the world. His legs and feet took him to forbidden places on purpose. Like when he went to Samaria and spoke to the woman at the well, and as a result, Samaritans came to know and believe in Jesus. Study where Jesus went. There's a whole movement now studying the words of Jesus called Red Letter Christianity. Somebody said, let's pay close attention to what Jesus is saying, and I'm adding to that, pay attention to where he went, why he went, and who he went for. As the body of Christ, our legs and feet should take us to those who are hurting, marginalized, and have no hope, for we are the body of Christ, and when we go, we ought to have the hands of Christ. For Jesus had healing in his hands when he touched Peter's mother, her fever left, and she rose and served him. He had hands of justice for when he went to the temple and saw the money changers exploiting the poor, his hands flipped those tables. And he said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus with a mindset of abundance, that's another part of the mind of Christ. It's not of scarcity, but there is plenty in God's kingdom. And with the mind of abundance and miraculous power in his hands, Jesus took two fish and five loaves with his hands, and it became a meal that fed 5,000. The songwriter said, little becomes much when you place it in the master's hands. We ought to have the legs and the feet of Christ to go where others won't go and the hand of Christ to touch who and what others won't touch. To be the body of Christ, we not only need the mind, the eyes, the mouth, the legs, and the feet and hands of Christ, but in order for all of that to function properly, we need the heart of Christ. Say the heart of Christ. The heart of Christ is simple. It's a heart of love. For when Jesus was asked which is the greatest commandment, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. If you can simply love, you'll fulfill all the other commandments. Love is the lifeblood of the body of Christ. Think about that. Love is what moves his mouth and his legs and his arms and his feet. It's the blood in the body. And though it seems simple, love is not simple. Because the heart is the central point of division. And if the body of Christ, the church universal, does not have the heart of Christ, we're divided in all other areas. 
We have a scarcity mindset. I'm talking we, Church Universal. If they come and take mine, they're going to take mine. I won't have what I need. Fear. It starts in the heart. They are different from me, inferior even. Starts in the heart and in the mind. I got mine. They need to get theirs. Starts in the heart. So I love that the lectionary included today with the Ephesians text, Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Hear this part. Restore to me. The joy, I don't need to be afraid. Lord, you have more than enough. I don't need to be down and sad. Lord, you can restore my joy. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit. Willing. 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 Some parts of the body of Christ and individual sects, locations, ethnicities are operating with broken and scarred, hurting and impure hearts. So this prayer, creating me a clean heart, will need to be the sincere prayer of the body of Christ. If it is ever to reach unity and operate as the body of Christ, for it was the love and the heart of Christ that gave him the mind of service and humility and justice. It was the love of Christ which gave him the eyes of compassion. It was the love of Christ that made his legs and feet go places others wouldn't go and hands touch people others wouldn't touch. But it was also the love of Christ that caused him to speak truth to power. Because, see, you can feed the hungry, but what you need to do is dismantle the systems that make them hungry. And sometimes that requires speaking truth to power. It was the love of Christ that caused him to flip tables of exploitation and caused him to stand against the oppression of the Roman Empire. It was the love of Christ that led to the crucifixion of Christ. And it was the love of Christ, however, that lifted his mind, his eyes, his legs, and feet up from the grave with all power in his hands. And that's the power, the resurrection power that he gave to the body of Christ, that is, the church. What a wondrous calling. If it feels overwhelming, look around. We don't have to do it alone. As a matter of fact, look beyond our church. I really wonder about what would happen if there weren't 250-something denominations, but we functioned as a body of Christ. When you have time, Dr. King preached a sermon entitled A Letter, Paul's Letter to the American Christians in 1958. As a matter of fact, he preached it at McCormick Theological Seminary and he was touring, preaching this sermon and he talks about the divisiveness within the body. He talks about the denominations and, and, the, and not only uh, the denominations within Protest Protestantism, but also within Catholicism and against Protest. I can't say that word this morning, being Protestant versus being Catholic. He spoke about it. He saw that the division is going to cause problems in America. I'll send that out this week. We have an amazing calling. And I know this is one of those sermons. I even, as I was preparing it, said, really, God? I'm preaching to the entire body. May it be so that one day the body of Christ is unified. God bless you.